you have not unmuted online so yeah i welcome all the uh, participants who are there either online or here with us the uh, topic of uh, today's lecture is pre modern cosmopolitanism in a coastal city 17th century masuli patnam it gives me immense pleasure to welcome uh, dr sonali mishra who is the speaker today and uh, she is somebody who has worked uh, on this and similar subjects for a very very long time uh, for uh, more than two decades and she uh, teaches history a medieval history and uh, some other aspects of history as well at uh, lady shiram college so uh, i extend a very very warm uh, welcome to sonali and uh, now uh, coming to the topic we generally associate uh, the idea of cosmopolitan with modernity we think that cosmopolitanism or cosmopolitan is something that came into existence say in the 19th century 20th century and so on however the fact is and this is i believe uh, sonali is going to talk about uh, this afternoon that uh, history has witnessed in some sense no matter which words we use to describe the phenomenon history has witnessed several waves of what we call globalization history has also witnessed several waves of international cooperation and it has also witnessed words may be a problem it has also witnessed several waves of cosmopolitanism in different locations in different parts of the world and of course in different circumstances in different periods of history uh now the cosmopolitanism that is being talked about here is a specific uh, variety of it which came into existence by the way uh, from uh, the end of the 16th century when the europeans sort of started they discovered the sea route from europe to asia and they started participating directly and not through arab uh, uh, intermediaries as they were doing for centuries before that so when they started uh, directly participating they they started coming to various ports of uh, uh, what they called asia and they started participating in uh, international trade directly a new kind of cosmopolitanism was born however i would go to the extent of arguing that even before the advent of europeans for 2000 years at least many of the important port cities of asia especially of india they were in some sense what we describe as cosmopolitanism now in what sense were they cosmopolitan one these coastal cities they had a flourishing international trade with almost all the known parts of the world second way in which they were cosmopolitanism they were cosmopolitan is that they involved traders merchants from different parts of the world from different regions these traders and merchants belong to different uh, religions different ethnicity different races etc etc third kind of uh, cosmopolitan character of uh, uh, this international trade was of course the variety of goods in which it dealt so again a very very uh, you know uh, how uh, how would i put it now very very rich kind of uh, 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 you know uh, list of goods which were uh, traded in these places now based upon this kind of cosmopolitan character then cultural and religious and other kinds of synthesis took place in many of these places masuli patnam is a very very good example of it located in the bay of bengal it it had become prominent uh, uh, much before the the advent of the europeans but the advent of the europeans opened a new chapter uh, Uh, in the in the in the history of mazuli patnam as an important international port so without now uh, further delay i would like to invite uh, dr sonali mishra to proceed with her lecture on the subject welcome once again uh, thank you to uh, dr avikas mishra and to nmml for inviting me for this and thank you all for joining me here today as well as online and uh, i hope to, uh, i hope to uh, you know take on from where ravikant has introduced the topic to you so um first of all when we talk about masuli patnam situating it some of you 
know where it is and some of you may not be so familiar with it. Am I audible? So the mic can, mic can be pulled up. Okay. All right. Yeah, nice. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, situating Masuli Patnam, it was uh, um, now known as Machli Patnam as well. Uh, speck on the vast coastline of the Indian subcontinent. In the 17th century, it um, it it comes into uh, prominence as a mega port uh, among a conglomerate of ports in the northern Coromandel region situated in the Krishna Godavari region, which was a very fertile uh, delta. And um, Masuri Patnam and its subordinate feeder ports, uh, Petropoli, Madhapolam, Narsapur, and others, um, they, um, at this point of time, formed a, a sub-region of a larger economic region of the Coromandel, which serviced uh, the Indian Ocean trade both to the eastwards and the westwards, connecting Europe, Africa, South Asia, the Indonesian archipelago, uh, and uh, China, Japan. So it was, uh, in fact, very uh, strategically located in the Bay of Bengal area. And uh, the prime importance of the port and its region drew from the textiles which were produced in the area. So uh, agriculturally, this area was uh, rich in the cultivation of rice and other agricultural produce, but uh, textiles were the backbone of the Indian Ocean trading system of the time period for which Masuli Patnam textiles are particularly uh, known. In fact, uh, Masuli Patnam as a port was one of the most important ports, not only of the northern Coromandel region, but of the entire Coromandel and uh, the entire Indian Ocean trading system in the 17th century, as we shall see in the uh, course of discussion to follow. So um, there were non-agricultural product, products also that were produced in the region, like um, iron and steel, indigo, and chay root, which supported the textile industry as well as uh, the shipbuilding industry. As some of these ports were also shipbuilding centers, these were the main subordinate ports of uh, Masuli Patna. And some of them had other functions apart from being ports. As we can see, they were also textile producing centers and shipbuilding centers of the Northern Coromandel. I've uh, marked out the area which shows uh, a density of weaver villages and production centers in the northern Coromandel, which is right where our port is. And the rest of these were a range of uh, weaving villages and centers centered around this region, which supplied Masuli Patnam and the other subordinate feeder ports. And some of them were also shipbuilding centers or uh, associated uh, industries like rope making, ironworks, and so on, which supported the shipbuilding industry. Um, However, it was primarily textiles, which was the mainstay of the trade of the region. And talking about textiles, while there were a range of textiles produced, particularly cotton textiles that we're talking about, from coarse cotton calicos to the finest of muslins, particularly the warangal pethiles, pethiles being the word that the Portuguese used for veilings. Um, so they were the finest of muslins, and apart from that, the uh, highly prized ones were also the chintz, the painted or printed cloth which was produced in the region, as well as the palampors, which were like bed covers. And here is an example of an embroidered muslin, but otherwise it is hard to make out uh, the muslin. It is very delicate, but samples of all of these are still available in some of the European museums. So coming to the port of Masuli Patnam, now this is um, an etching by Philippus uh, Baldius uh, in the 17th century, uh, which shows the port and the city and a large swamp in between and bridges as well. Uh, I could take you to the next slide, which is an 18th century production uh, in color. And you could, how does this work? Okay, I, I, I'm not sure if I can, if you can see that uh, there are a couple of bridges also, which can be seen, which were not there. They were, thank you. Which, which one? Okay, thank you. Okay, 
So um, that's one, and this one's the other. One is very prominent. So these bridges are, uh, they were built by a Persian merchant magnate by the name of Mir Abdullah Bakir, who was an administrator of an, of an elite level, as well as a merchant magnate. And that was a typical feature of the region where there was a coalescence of the functions of administration, political and administrative functions, along with commercial functions. He wasn't the only one. There were several Persian merchant uh, administrators in the region who had uh, fleets of ships and uh, carried on overseas shipping along with their administrative functions. Many of them had in so fact... Can you speak a bit louder? Um, the is being done and we want it to be done effectively. Okay, I'm sorry if I was not very audible. No, here you are audible, okay. but because of the recording, I want to All right. Okay, is this better now? All right. So, um, um, right, we were talking about the Persian merchant administrators of the time period. Um, the region of Masuli Patnam fell under the kingdom of Golconda at this point of time, which was governed by the Qutub Shahis, uh, who had migrated from the Hamadan region of, of uh, Iran. And they uh, had a deliberate policy of fostering their connections with uh, Persia by inviting Persians to become administrators and partake in the commercial and political functions of the region. So, um, as we were talking about these bridges, they were built by Mir Abdullah Bakir, um, who himself was a merchant magnate. And here, we, these flags that we can see, they are in fact uh, of the English factories, which were actually uh, European factories that were go-downs, where they collected their uh, uh, goods for, uh, which were brought in from Europe and other places, as well as the goods which had to be laden onto the ships. So um, what we're going to talk about later is the urban development of Masuli Patnam, these multi-storied buildings as they can be seen. Now, in terms of uh, Masuli Patnam wasn't um, already in the forefront in the, in the 17th century. In fact, uh, at the, the start of the 17th century, it, it had it is described as not so significant, where more of the trading was done from Motu Pali further northwards. So different travelers' accounts through the um, to, throughout the 17th century period give the trajectory of the development of the said port um, as it grew in its uh, significance, functions, and stature, as also as it declined towards the end of the century. So in, in, in the early uh, part of the 17th century, Bethworld describes it as a small populous town which was ill-planned, defenseless, and poorly situated. But it had become more important by this time. And then there are other accounts of the English factors and other travelers and visitors who, who, whose uh, descriptions show how the city was growing and expanding and becoming uh, more flourishing over the course of the 17th century, where, for example, the English factors talk about multi-storied buildings which had come up, which were not there before, but now they are uh, they are uh, they were towering over the English company, its uh, English factory itself. And uh, yes, yeah, so it was described as a celebrated town or uh, the center of all commerce on the Coromandel coast, and so on not just for the Coromandel, for Bengal, Manila, China, etc. And uh, in the 1670s, which was about the peak of the trajectory of development of Masuli Patnam, Thomas Powdy, he talks about how it's, uh, it had become more, the most significant and eminent uh, port of trade on the Coromandel coast. So quite unanimously, all of them described it as extremely populous, very well populated, and with a very uh, a strategic location, which had uh, attracted a lot of, in this case, Christians, but as we shall see, other Asians also in the region. Now, in uh, 1673, John Fryer, uh, he estimated the population of Masuli Patnam to be about two lakhs. At this point of time, there were very few cities with a population over one lakh, and most of the ports had a population of just about 10,000. So as we can see, this was a highly populated and popular port. 
and Fryer also gave uh, detailed descriptions of the town and urban features of Masuli Patnam, uh, talking about the high streets, which were broad, but a lot of the, the rest of it was with narrow streets and congested buildings coming up in, in a, you know, a confined space where more and more people had been uh, uh, attracted because of the trade and other infrastructure. So he gives a, uh, a pretty detailed account of the kind of uh, buildings that had come up, which are more in the what, what was called the Moorish style. And Bari also gives a description of the elite buildings, multi-story buildings of the Islamic style, which had come up over there. The trajectory of the development of Masuli Patnam coincides with the growth of the kingdom of uh, Golconda as well. And it was a deliberate policy of the Qutub Shahis of Golconda to, uh, to actually focus on the development of the port city of Masuli Patnam. As we've already noted, they invited Persian, Persian adventurers to become uh, administrators, come merchants in the area. But the other factor which also led to the, the growth of the city was also the, the advent of the European trading companies. And we shall talk about that in a little while. Um, in the 1680s and 90s, the port of Masuli Patnam also starts to uh, decline. And that, again, is concomitant with the decline of the Qutub Shahi uh, dominions in Golconda when Mughal, uh, Mughal uh, conquest takes place in 1687 of, of the kingdom of Golconda, as well as there are other factors like, uh, you know, the Maratha inroads, which cause political dislocation, and um, some natural calamities like droughts and so on which added to the uh, troubles here. But uh, another important feature is that by this time, the English were operating uh, on a strong foothold from Port St. George, which was not the case at the, the, the beginning of the century, or in fact, it was something which takes place in 1640. So um, coming to when, um, you know, the climate and ecology of Masuli Patnam, while it had uh, access to a very productive hinterland and sophisticated mechanisms of uh, commerce from um, you know, different business communities, not just the merchant magnets and the weavers who produce these fine textiles, uh, and, um, and, and the whole textile industry, which was geared from, from you know, the cotton coming from the black soil rich Deccan region to uh, you know, uh, dyes coming from the che root and indigo produced in the region even sapin wood, which was uh, ex imported from um, Cambodia. So the textile industry was already there to give it its benefit. And apart from that, it was a rice producing region, which supported weaver population at, uh, 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 at, at comfortable rates of subsistence. So Coming to the climate and, and ecology, Masuli Patnam was in fact not, and, and its subordinate ports were not located on uh, in a very favorable region, which was prone to cyclones then as it is to cyclones now. Apart from that, almost all the travelers describe it as having a very hostile, inhospitable environment with bad air and brackish and saline water and a stifling city layout. And uh, the marsh that we saw in the image uh, in the etchings where there's a large marsh or swampy area which had a foul stench and apart from humidity, insects and diseases. In fact, fire gives a rather evocative description of how the heat was suffocating, causing birds to drop down dead um, in, in the area. So we can well imagine how prejudicial these uh, conditions were for the Europeans as they came from, uh, as they came from much uh, you know, cooler climate to adapt over here. And in the initial period, at least, the uh, mortality rate was extremely high among the Europeans. And they did make uh, ecological adaptations. So in the, Masuli, uh, uh, the, the suburban area surrounding Masuli Patnam, which was Petapoli, Matapolam, Narsapur, all of these places, these were preferred by the Europeans and even the elite Persian administrators and other elite merchants to have their residential areas here with sanatoriums and gardens and other uh, sort of residential areas. Uh, and even the administrative center was in Guduru. And in Guduru was favored by 
both Hindu and Muslim merchants for their residential uh, houses. And it's interesting to note that among the Europeans whose houses are mentioned in these areas, all of these names come up in the context of private trading. Richard Mohan, Edward Winter, who was, a, who was quite a, a character, a nefarious private trader, who had in fact even taken over Fort St. George at one point of time under his own command. Robert Fleetwood, who uh, was also farming out revenues of Virus Firm, we will talk about that later, and uh, Comble and others, along with Persian merchant magnates like Mir Abdullah Bakir and others. So the, these in, inland areas are described as the residential complexes for the most eminent men, Moors and Persians, a sort of most insolent men. So this was the elite uh, area which was uh, you know, somewhat removed from the port. And in this we see uh, not just ecological adaptations taking place, but there were other kinds of adaptations and tacit alliances which are taking place between uh, the the European private traders and the the Persian and uh, Persian merchant administrator, as well as other mercantile communities. So we will come to that shortly. As other accounts like those of Shora and Shotan have shown, there were Persians, Arabs, Turks, Burmese, many many of these Asians also who lived here, from Arakan, Pegu, Bengal, Malacca, Surat, and so on. So what we have is that the, the port city of Masuli Patnam and its environs were in fact inhabited by a whole range of Europeans, uh, the Portuguese, the English, the Dutch, the Danes, the French being the most prominent, but a, a sprinkling of other Europeans as well. Along with that, there were Armenians and uh, um, Javanese, Chinese, Malays, si Siamese, and several other, uh, Peguans, Burmese, several other Asians who were there, as well as indigenous merchants like the Tamil, Telugus, Klings, and uh, uh, Bijapuris, Bengalis, Oriyas, a whole, whole range of indigenous merchants also mentioned as uh, either residing there or being itinerant merchants. So we have a very cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan picture of the region. and. Um, this, the state and infrastructure had a, a big role to play in maintaining the cosmopolitanism of Masuli Patnam, as we shall see that the rulers, the Qutub Shahis and their administrators ensured that the port of Masuli Patnam remained neutral throughout. Um, Masuli Patnam had been conquered by the Kingdom of Golconda, which was in fact an offshoot of the Bahamanis um, before them. And as they conquered Masuli Patnam, they ensured that the port remains neutral for all. And uh, even uh, so, so, some of these uh, tell us the nature of the neutrality. For example, Europeans could not interfere with the Muslim and Hindu merchants. Uh, there was religious tolerance which was practiced. And uh, Martin uh, Proswa Mates says that Europeans enjoyed more liberty and autonomy in Masuli Patnam than in any other Indian city. They were permitted to exercise justice on those employed by them. And um, we also have, uh, uh, even though the even though the Europeans, uh, the, the English founded their fortified enclave of Fort Saint George, uh, which gave them a, a much stronger foothold. Even at, at that time, they continued to hold on to Masuli Patnam because they said that the, the trading privileges which they had in Masuli Patnam were greater than those they had around the Fort St. George. Because Masuli Patnam was in the area of the old territories of Golconda where they, they had much greater privileges of customs free trading, which was not the case in the new, new, newly conquered territories as the southward conquest took place later in the 17th century. And in fact, the founding of Fort St. George took place uh, when it was, which is now uh, Chennai, at that time it was Chennapatnam under one of the local Nayaks of uh, the region and was outside the territorial boundary of Kulkonda. Uh, therefore, the English could manage to get a fortification over there because within the uh, within the political boundaries of Golconda, a strong state like that did not allow any of the Europeans, be they the English or the Dutch, the Danes, French, to fortify within their dominions. And even the, the Dutch um, 
a set of a fortified enclave of Pulikat and Armagao were founded before they were taken over by Golconda. So, as we can see, that they, the there was the there was a, a specific state policy to maintain neutrality in the region. Now, coming to the rise of the English East India Company, I focused more on the English than the Dutch. Um, though the Dutch presence was uh, slightly earlier and much stronger than the English for most of the 17th century, and it is only in, as, as this graph shows, uh, the investments of the English East India Company, it is only towards uh, the latter portion of the 17th century that the English trade actually picks up. And um, so uh, Masuli Patnam and its environments were in where they initially traded from, but then later on, 1641, 40, is around when the founding of Fort St. George. And we can see that their fortunes start to improve around that time from this graph and peaking around the mid 1680s. Now, how did this transition take place? If you look at the 1620s and even the 1630s, the records of the English company show their very dismal uh, state of affairs after their very tentative beginnings on the coast, where, uh, as you can see here, they, the, the factors are lamenting to their president and council at Batavia. The Dutch in their glory laugh in their, in their cells at our present miseries and much disparage the sufficiency of Mr. Duke, which is table talk amongst them, and of our small means at present in Masla Patnam, um, not in the 10th degree comparable to theirs, that is the Dutch, which is much noted among these people. God send us better means to employ ourselves or a short warning to call us home. For in this case, we are now in, is neither beneficial to our masters, mm -hmm. nor credit to our nation, nor content to ourselves. So the English, uh, they continue to be in a rather uh, miserable state of affairs stuck with without any money to invest and and their whatever money they had was locked up in goods like uh, uh, you know porcelain uh, which they brought from england and quicksilver and women quicksilver uh, and broadcloth which did not have much of a market in the place so um this is these were the english factories in the coromandel in the 17th century and uh, most of their focus remained around Masuli Patnam and its immediate feeder ports. It's only in 1640-41 that Fort St. George is founded. And the Dutch had nine factories in the region and a much stronger presence and much more funds and a better business sense from what we figure because the English uh, start to pick up following the Dutch examples as well as that of other. Um, uh, so here I can sort of tell you about the early beginnings of the English company, um, the way that they really picked up uh, on their trade, these were two of the milestones which they achieved in 1634 when they acquired the Golden Farman and in 1640-41 when Fort St. George is founded. So the English private trade uh, is, is something which I want to discuss in this context because while the company trade was languishing, it is interesting that as early as the 1618 period where Methwold and others are talking about, we hear of uh, the company orders that private trade has to be rigorously suppressed. So while the company trade was languishing, private trade of the English agents, which was not allowed by the company, was in fact uh, doing quite well. And uh, I'm going to take a look at some of the implications of that over here. So. Um, the company initially did not engage in the textile trade of the Coromandel, their prime interest being the procurement of spices for Europe, while selling uh, English wares like porcelain and broadcloth and so on, like we mentioned earlier. Um, Methwell reported private traders had informed him that they tripled their investments in... So these are some of the things that we're going to talk about, the role of the private trade and the information network this is basically to see how the Europeans get an edge uh, after their tentative and dismal beginnings. And also, uh, we take a look at some of the aspects over here. So how did they negotiate the trading privileges? Um, when we find that um, in the beginning, they need to understand how to uh, 
procure uh, advantages like customs free trade. The Dutch had managed to procure these advantages before the English. The English were not able to do so. Um, this is uh, basically a, a range of officials, right from the Sultan down to you know the the gatekeepers and lower level people, that had to be uh, that had to be uh, sort of given gifts to get access into the political uh, circles. Now, the, the Englishmen are not quite familiar with the process of doing this in the beginning. In fact, they quite resented when the local governors asked for uh, gifts and uh, other exactions from them where they keep on com uh, complaining about them and have problems. And in fact, they even deserted Masuli Patnam in 1630 because they had so many problems with the local port authorities. They were unfamiliar with the system of peshkashes and tashris and, in, and uh, the protocol of gifts, which allowed for them to get uh, access to the people who would uh, acquaint them better with uh, not only the uh, not only the the routes and commodities of trade which were profitable, but also get them access into uh, the, the access to the administrators, who would then give them the benefits that that uh, tilted these in their favor, that tilted the balance of trade in their favor. Now, was um, sorry. So in the beginning, um, as you can see already, there are reports of how private traders were doubling and tripling their investments by following the um, you know, bantam route from selling Masuli Patnam cloth. At this point of time, the English East India Company focused more on spices from the Southeast Asian uh, islands and, and the coast, as well as on diamonds. But um, they started... Uh, they started noting that the Dutch and the uh, uh, private traders were making more profits by taking cloth to Bantam. Now, in 1620-21, Methwold had sent samples of Masuli Patnam cloth to the company in England for their consideration. And at this point, the company was exploring alternative routes and strategies and other commodities for England from Masuli Patnam. So cotton cloth started to gain popularity in Europe at this time, and they were also attempting to participate in the Red Sea trade from Masuri Patnam, and they envisaged profits and leverage from the protection that they could offer to the native merchants in this trade, which was what the Portuguese had been doing so far. The westward Surat Persia trade of the English was significant from the point of view of their trade from the Coromandel coast, as later in 1634, they were able to extract a very promising deal that we know as the Golden Parman, from the king of Golconda, which gave them the right of customs free trade in the kingdom for a small amount of 8,000 pagodas. Pagodas was a gold currency at that point of time. Uh -huh. Now, they managed to get this from the Golconda king on the ground, on the basis of the amity which they had uh, with the Shah of Persia at that point of time, because they had helped in the capture of Ormus, and in fact, they had even been sharing the customs of uh, the port of Gobru with the Shah of Persia. And uh, the kings of Golconda wanted to foster that link with Persia. Uh, so the English managed to obtain the Golden Parman. And um, on the part of the Sultan, he had anticipated that uh, favorable rapport with the English uh, and the Shah of Persia would foster the trade relations between Bandar Abbas and, and Golconda as well. And additional benefits would be English protection to native shipping, as well as obtaining the prized Persian horses and other rarities for themselves. Now, from 1624 till the end of 1630s, the English strove to expand to suitable places southwards in the Hindu territories of the Nayaks of Tanjore and Jinji on the Coromandel coast, from where they had hoped to operate with more strength, security, and liberty. They were re relocating due to problems faced at Masuli Patnam accruing from what they call the abuses, which had become insufferable by them because of the governors there. So at this point of time, they were not getting along well with the port authorities. Their settlement in Masuli Patna was ordered to be dissolved in 1628, but it was re-established in 1630. Not only because it was so significant for the procurement of textiles, but also because uh, a lot of the private trader, trading interests of the English agents required for them to have a presence in Masuli Patnam and its environment. So um, 
the trade, the customs free trade that the English East India Company derived from um, Masuli Patnam and Petropoli and so on was in fact much, much higher than the Sultan had estimated when he granted them the golden Parman. So the expense that they encountered was quite uh, insignificant in comparison to the benefits that they obtained. And the next milestone that they got was Fort St. George at Chennai in 1640-41. And um, that, that also came um, as, as one uh, more strengthening factor for the English trade at this point of time. Now, by the 1650s, the English agents at Masuli Patnam were making profitable investments, sending and receiving goods from Bantam, Pegu, Syrian, Johor, Achin, Yoruk, Persia, and Gombrun. The Persian, uh, sorry, this period was, uh, it witnessed a greater scale of private trade than was, uh, the, uh, you know, considering the expansion of the English company trade. It was also an expansion of the uh, English private trade, which is taking place at this point of time. From 1660s onwards, the Coromandel absorbed about one third of the total investments of the English in India. And the great bulk of this went into the procurement of the textiles of Kulkonda. So um, there's now that we see that the, the, the balance of trade has shifted for the English East India Company. But these trading privileges were not very easily obtained and the negotiations had to continue. Uh, the paying of tashrifs um, uh, and gifts of honor to significant officials that we talked about and low level functionaries to relevant authorities. They also had to maintain these privileges because they were not given uh, in perpetuity. They had to keep amicable relations with the rulers and other important political personages. For them, the Europeans, their power at sea and their ability to provide safe passage to the ships of the natives was their leverage. However, they could not trade in the region if they were denied permission from the local authorities. So until the 1630s, the Europeans had been largely unsuccessful because they had been unfamiliar with the local customs and norms. The initial trading concessions were only meant for the company trade, but the private trade of the Europeans of the English at this time prompted them to use the company customs free and other uh, services like plating goods to extend the privileges to uh, other merchants and port administrators for their own shipping. And in this way, they started to build tacit alliances. Uh, A bit louder. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, um, yes, we're talking about the, the tacit alliances, right? So, um, when the English were unofficially extending the privileges which were given to the company for their own private trading or to even some of their indigenous merchant friends, the port, port authorities were being denied their fair share of revenue and that could lead to some complications. But at the same time, some of these port administrators were also deriving unofficial benefits from the English company trade. So now we can see through the series of uh, investigations against charges which are leveled against Richard Mohan, Matthew Menzering, Robert Fleetwood, and several of the, uh, of the uh, English uh, agents, that uh, they were in fact engaged in, uh, in what was not permitted by the company and some uh, in, in terms of extending you know, uh, trade services and so on to these um, the so-called friends of theirs in the uh, administration and uh, among the merchant magnates as well. So um, accessing the political elite for negotiating trading privileges involved complex protocol. The English learned the etiquette through the friendships they had developed with these local authorities and native merchant magnates on account of their private trade. Apart from this, there were Brahmins in their employment, and these Brahmins, they served as liaison, communicating with their counterparts who were similarly employed by the native authorities. So this is a different role played by these, what they, they called as Brahminis. Peshkashas or customary gifts which were given to such uh, uh, influential people, it not only secured trading concessions, but had other implications too. 
in October 1674, English agents wrote of the expectations of gifts by Mirza Ibrahim, who was the great governor of Masili Patna, who could have caused immense damage to the trade of the English, either directly by impeding their business in the area under his jurisdiction, or indirectly by encouraging the Dutch or other competitors to the detriment of the business of the English company. He could also injure the interests of the English by jeopardizing their reputation with the King of Golconda, which could have resulted in the loss of their trading privileges in his dominion. Such expenditure on acquiring and maintaining good relations with the political circles was more in the nature of investments, which ensured better trading terms to the Europeans. On the whole, their expenses were insignificant compared to the profits they obtained through the edge that they got in their business. Besides the prevalent political, uh, political cultural ethos, uh, it required such customary exchanges and curtsies as an integral uh, part of the local elite culture. Now, this is in stark contrast to the dealings of the English with the local governors in the initial decades of the century, when they resented the payment of bribes and peshkashes to the local authorities. They even lost out on an opportunity to gain trading concessions in 1630 when they had failed to get a call, which was a promise or a consent of the governor of Petropoli ratified by either the great governor or the king, which resulted in its invalidity. They admitted that this lapse was due to their ignorance of the local customs. But gradually, they became better acquainted with the ways and means of obtaining favors and maintaining them. So, um, so they, um, in terms of the private trade, the, these connections which they fostered, the European private traders and the local port authorities, especially in the interior towns and villages, they had important implications in the political economic scenario as a result of the greater experience and the contacts which was gained by European agents in the course of trading activities in this manner. They had entered into lucrative arrangements with Asian merchants, ship owners and local port authorities. It is not insignificant to note that the Europeans were even farming out revenues of towns on their personal accounts like Robert Fleetwood in the case of Virasvaram and emulating the native revenue farmers. Now, revenue farming was a political administrative function. So, uh, in fact, the Dutch had also farmed out the revenues of Palakolu, which was uh, one of the important textile producing uh, towns. And from the 1670s in particular, the company's affairs become particularly disturbed by the private trading activities of these company agents, Edward Winter, Richard Mohan, Matthew Mainsbring, Stranger Master was in fact sent by the board of directors to sort out the matters and these uh, irregularities come to the fore through these investigations which take place, the volumes filled with these investigations. The charges against Richard Mohan were rather serious. Uh, agents noted that his misuse of the company's money for uh, his own investments and debts resulted in debt trade for the company's ships as the company's investments could not be made on time. However, he was not the only agent indulging in private trade. In fact, most of the English agents in and around Masuli Patna, Madapola, Petropoli and other interior towns were involved in illegal private trade. Further, the private trade of these Europeans was often in connivance with the local port authorities Private trading did not only have negative consequences for the companies, it also facilitated commercial relations with influential local magnates like Mir Kamaluddin and Mir Abdullah Bakir, and officials and administrators of the ports in important market towns and production centers who often had mercantile interests. It also entailed the mutual exchange of freight services and other benefits which could possibly extend to using each other's links with the port and customs authorities for abatements, smooth passage of goods, and other advantages. The English agents also seem to have extended some company privileges and services to such influential administrators come merchants. Consequently, through private trade, the English agents were actually building a tacit net network of relationships with the native mercantile and political entities, which would have given them a better understanding of the commercial system of the region and a much firmer leverage and entrenchment. So they could serve as precious consultants on how to conduct a more profitable business, whether on their own account or on behalf of the company. So um, we can. Uh, it, it's interesting that at this point of time, not only are the the the, the English factors engaging in these uh, you know grey areas of uh, um, not purely commercial but also administrative uh, uh, 
functions to some extent, to a limited extent. But there are other commercial categories like the Persian merchant magnets, as well as some mercantile community, you know, um, entities like Kasi Iran, who also engaged in revenue farming in the region. So there was a blurring of boundaries between political functions and administrative functions and commercial uh, enterprises at this point of time. And that was the interesting part is not only for the local elite and the local merchants, but also that the Europeans had started to uh, step into that territory. Um, another point that emerges is that that of conflict and collaboration. While we, we see that the English had uh, conflicts with the port authorities, they also had conflicts with some of the local mercantile communities. There were there, there, there's a, a whole lot of description of uh, hostilities, even though the Kutub Shahis of Golconda maintained neutrality and emphasized on peace because hostilities were detrimental to trade. However, there were in fact conflicts, but also collaborations because in the end, different uh, uh, in, uh, invested uh, entities, regardless of their nationality or race or ethnicity or region, would come in to mediate between the, the conflicting parties to find solutions so that trade could continue in a, a sort of smooth fashion. And there you have conflicts and collaborations which transcend these uh, normative categories of nation or, and uh, linguistic and re uh, religious affinities or caste or class and so on, because you find that in this cosmopolitan uh, milieu of uh, the port and its environments, different categories um, play out their, um, uh, you know, um, conflicts and collaborations at multiple levels in a rather complex setting. Um, this, um, this is not unusual because Rao Subramaniam and Shulman have also shown that uh, at, at this point of time, uh, you know, uh, in the after the disintegration of the Vijayanagar Empire, there was already uh, sort of socio-political mobility taking place in the form of Telugu's and uh, uh, others moving in into the you know Tamil areas and Balijas merchant category who were becoming nayaks or administrators and rulers in the region who were otherwise from uh, the Shudra class, the caste. So um, you have a, a transcending of normative identity markers in terms which there's a sort of relative uh, fluidity and flux and dynamism which makes us want to relook at the parameters of what we would call the pre-modern South Asian state. I think I'm going to end there because I already got a reminder from. No, no, that's okay. You can take a couple more minutes. If, uh, you we want. can take it in, in terms of uh, discussion there. So I suppose. All right. Um, I think I've covered all of these points where we, you know, so if you want, like for example, Brahmins who were the Liazo people, um, they were also traders, they were uh, accountants, they were seen to be arith arithmeticians. In fact, they were also astrologers who were consulted by the merchants before they undertook any ventures, which was both by the Hindu as well as Muslim merchants. And uh, yeah, so this is basically another point that um, for the Europeans to get access to the political administrative elite, they had to understand the social, uh, socio-political ethos, the cultural ethos, where these uh, uh, accoutrements um, like palanquins and horses and roundels and pipes and drums and so on. All of these had to be part and parcel of the um, status of, of any particular person and the Europeans had to in fact uh, maintain these as well. When they tried to downsize, they in fact lost esteem and lost business. So they had to resort to uh, adopting these again. So these are some of the points that I've made here that while the private trade of the English flourished, it, it, it was not only detrimental to the English East India Company, but I'm arguing that in fact, it, it paved the way for a more successful mm -hmm. business for the English East India Company because of these tacit uh, nexus uh, alliance that were formed by the private traders and administrator come merchants and port authorities. Uh, on the other side, there could be private deals which, were, which did not go so well and could adversely affect the English East India Company affairs. And that was also the case in some, sorry, you can, I can talk about this in discussion if you like. And yeah, so this is what I can end over here. Thank you very much, Sonali, for uh, giving us a, a detailed account and uh, 
very important account of uh, this subject. Uh, we are now open to questions and comments from the audience. Please go ahead, Dr. Barney. Uh, <clears throat> I enjoyed your uh, talk, listening, uh, your you know, detailed discussion. You. But let me confess, this is not my area. Okay. So I cannot uh, make any specific comments on any specific uh, issues. Even though I also studied history in my MA, they are also in the medieval India from their university. I shifted and branched out to a different domain altogether. So I, I do not remember anything of whatever I studied in MA. Now coming back. <coughs> To your um, in presentation, as a researcher, I have certain general kind of you know observations which I would like to make, which might be relevant for uh, the others also. Uh, you mentioned about so many facts and figures. What is what are your sources? You never mentioned anything about that. Yes. Number sure. one. No, let, let, let me complete. I have got four five points. Sure. Uh, did you second? What language materials you used? Yes. Uh, because this entails uh, many, you know, South Indian languages and maybe, right. you know, foreign languages. Yes. Do you have any expertise in any of the languages? I have no information, so I'd like to know about that. Right. Third, did you undertake any uh, field visits? Like, you know, did you go to this spot and talk to some people there? Whether uh, there were uh, uh, some elderly people who were aware of or maybe who could throw some light on your field of study? Uh, because those are all rare informations, yeah. uh, if at all, if we have done that. Um, number four, okay. is your study confined to only Muslim or also covered similar uh, trading activities taking place elsewhere in the country? For example, in Odisha, for example. Okay. Odisha has a very, very long tradition of trading uh, with the Southeast Asian nations. So similarly, maybe West Bengal also. Okay. So uh, is it... Uh, uh, very micro study on, only on you know the South India, or you have also enlarged. Last point, uh, you talked also about balance of trade. Yes, balance, yes, balance of yes. trade about. You know, uh, have you got any trade figures about that, which you could share with us, or maybe uh, since you spoke about the trade? Yes, uh, actually, this. Uh, and what are the sources of the I trade? I think uh, Sonali, let us take a few questions yes. before you answer. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If you I, are done, I, I you will take more questions. Okay. You have noted down? Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, you can go ahead and you can answer these points. Sorry, and then maybe others then can. Then we can go to others. As you wish. Depends. If there are any related no, questions. I, I just questions. wanted uh, to know what was the condition in Surat? Hmm. If there, you know, because it was a a similar situation over there and then with the rise of the East India Company we see the decline of Surat and the rise of Bombay. Mm -hmm. So if you could throw some light. Yeah. So uh, I'll come yeah, to you that. can May start with her question and then go. Yeah, Madhuji, uh, yeah. please go ahead. Mine is on a different no. No, no. <laughs> uh, uh, It's more general. I'm, I'm actually very puzzled mm -hmm. by a, the title of the lecture mm -hmm. Cosmopolitanism you right. say. Right. Now, I don't know how you define cosmopolitanism, mm -hmm. but what I hear mm -hmm. in your lecture mm -hmm. is the end, uh, the uh, fading of the Islamic imperial rule mm -hmm. and the coming in of the European colonial rule. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't know how the dominance of power play between these groups right. contending to colonize India can be called cosmopolitan. To my mind, uh, the term is completely misplaced okay. because we know what follows and what had proceeded in, say, the establishment of Islamic rule in these parts or all over India. Uh, it was hardly a benign cosmopolitan affair, the coming in of the Persians or the Arabs, the Turks or the Afghans. We're talking about cosmopolitanism in the pre-colonial period. Actually. Yes, yes. But not, I'm saying, I'm saying, period. A, there is that 
elite which has established power over India and large parts of India through brute savagery, unprecedented in the history of mankind, is how even Bill Turan describes the, the, the establishment of Islamic rule in India. Unprecedented genocide, subjugation, etc. Now that obviously is giving way now to European colonization. Uh, the beginning or uh, laying the ground not yet happened, but it's the very, you know, they are laying the ground for establishing a foothold. Whether Dutch or British or Portuguese, we know how brutal that whole process was. So for me, the, this story is full of nightmares if I were to read between lines. It's not such a neutral, cosmopolitan story. Okay, I'll address uh, that. It's the process of wrecking of the Indian economy. It's the loot of the Indian economy. Well, and, and, and wrecking of, no, I'm saying, so I know that you will find, um, uh, I mean, you, you so sanitized it that I don't recognize India in it. So we're talking specifically of the 17th century period one. And these figures, as we, these are actually uh, actual figures of the kinds of investments that were coming in on the English ships. So the, this particular graph that is, uh, is, is actually showing you actual figures. Um, let me start and address the questions yes, yes. Uh, as they came. So in terms of the sources, that is a very pertinent question because ironically, uh, most, in fact, all of my reliance so far on this material has been on European uh, records, whether it is the day-to-day -day factory correspondences or travelogues of the Europeans. So there were very meticulous uh, accounts which are maintained. Some of them are published, some of them are still in, in the manuscript form. But they are a rich amount of day-to-day -day correspondence which throws light not only on the Europeans but also on the indigenous merchants and port authorities and so on and so forth. And we, for the 17th century, we do not have uh, any sort of comparable, uh, you know, source in the, in the indigenous sources. Persian sources don't throw much light on this. And so far as the Tamil and Telugu sources, and that's very pertinent here because Rao uh, Subramanian Shulman have looked upon literature, which is uh, there in the Tamil and Telugu uh, uh, languages at this point at this point of time, and at least a little bit of glimpse you can get, but not in great detail. Uh, for example, they refer to the Europeans as Hunas and Svetavadana, which is white-faced. And Hunas is a term for, you know, uh, tri uh, sort of invaders of antiquity. So they're, um, and, you know, they appreciate their fair dealing, but they, they sort of uh, talk about them not respecting the, the pure, you know, rules of purity and so on. They don't have a very specific knowledge of them, not just in the port cities, but even uh, for that matter, in the, uh, the Mughal circles, the Europeans are not so um, looked upon as, you know, belonging to different nations or even, as I've argued elsewhere, an Asian gaze which sees Europe and Asia in a binary. In fact, for them, they're just, you know, some more of the foreigners. As, and this, that's where your cosmopolitanism comes in, because here you have all kinds of Asians, the, the Burmese, the Cambodians, the Vietnamese, the, the Malays, the Indonesians, the Chinese and the Japanese. Not so much a mention of the Japanese, but we do have a mention of, uh, you know, like, not just uh, as traders, but for example, there'd be straight references to the factor of the king of Siam. So even the rulers of these places had their own agents coming in and living in, in renting houses, living over here. And it's, it's Asians and Europeans and indigenous merchants like the Bijapuris, Bengalis, Oriyas and Klings and so on. All of them, even Surat merchants, Gujaratis, who are living here as, as uh, you know, on a temporary or permanent basis, they're expatriates, they're migrants, itinerants, and so on, and adventurers. It's it's a very um, I haven't talked about all of it, but uh, you know, you you get a, uh, as you read the records, you get the sense of the the vast area of people who are functioning in the port, uh, and there are a lot of descriptions in say the accounts of Prasvah Mathe or even in the factory records of the, the English, where there are a whole lot of uh, conflicts which take place, not just among the Asians and the Europeans, because that would be very sort of, you know, um, that would be a kind of a teleological assumption within the Europeans. There's rivalry between the English and the Dutch. There's rivalry with the Portuguese. They have their own, uh, you know, uh, dynamics playing out over there. 
and they can ally with the indigenes religiously and likewise. So they they also the the indigenous merchants got some benefits out of them like uh, trading and safe passage and so on uh, from the European ships because the Europeans had a sort of a, an armed presence on the sea unlike the the natives and the Asians and that that sort of uh, gave them an advantages in their dealings but on the land the the land powers and that's probably where I think one of your questions comes in Surat and Bombay and so on. Fortified enclaves could not be carved out in a strong polity like that of Golconda. It was only before the Golconda dominion uh, sort of, you know, expanded to the southwards that uh, Fort St. George, Armagao, Pulika, these fortified enclaves are found. And Bombay, Surat and all of these, these are worked out. Again, I have not worked so much on Surat, so I have not comment a lot on, on the process in which they managed to get their uh, you know, fortified enclaves, but again, these were not easy to get because they gave them a, a huge advantage over the indigenes and other Asian merchants. So this is something which comes in the later part. As you saw that though the, the Dutch managed uh, Armagon and Pulikat as, as early as 1612, I showed you, but that is be before Armagon is, it's, it's these uh, petty Naya principalities, which are sort of, you know, the disintegrated Vijayanagar Empire. The, these Nayaks thought that if they attract a trade to their ports, they are also going to prosper. So they gave these uh, concessions to attract more trading to their ports. But in a strong uh, kingdom like Golconda, the port was kept neutral and we saw how. In fact, uh, Francois Mata's account gives a lot of detailed uh, accounts of the conflicts which took place and almost invariably there were, uh, you know, the larger merchant magnates who would come and intervene between the conflicting parties to bring, ships would be burned, people, there would be loss of life and property. They wanted to end that because it would delay the season. If it does that, then obviously the whole season is lost because this was based on seasonal uh, wind flows and so on. And um, about the language materials, I do hope to be exploring because there's some translation work being done on uh, in because I do not have knowledge of Tamil and Telugu. In fact, uh, some of the Europeans did and they got better paid when they had learned the local languages by the company. And uh, even though there were Dubashas or translators available at that point of time. But um, right now I know that there are some of the Tamil accounts which have been translated and are being translated and I hope to be able to use them soon because I don't have first hand knowledge. And uh, so far as Urissa is concerned, yes, I have looked at Urissa too, which is known as the Jinjili coast, like this is Coromandel coast, so, you know, some ports like Pipli and Hariharpur and so on. And um, um, this is the main one over there, sorry, it's escaping my uh, mind at the moment. It's, uh, so, but, um, so there's, you know, Urissa and the bay, it's, it's, it's an entire trading region. There's also something called coasting trade where the trade is uh, exchange is taken, like gingerly oil from Orissa down here. And so, on, you know, good beans and, and Arakan, that's Burma. So the entire region is well integrated into the trade. You cannot, the nature of trade itself is such that you cannot do it uh, with just a single point focus. So you do, but you know, there's, you can't talk about everything uh, at this point of time. But yes, I have looked at all of these, though I want to look at things also from in terms of material, if possible, also from the places that were traded with particularly in Southeast Asia, because that was that was the original trading uh, area. Yes. And then you have um, Red Sea and Persian Gulf areas added with the Persian connection fostered by the Golconda rulers. And then you have the European market opening up, as which we discussed as, as of now. So, but the eastward cycle was already well entrenched by the time the Europeans came in and to some extent also the Persian Gulf that was also quite well entrenched Persian Gulf Red Sea market so the additional market was a European market and there the textile industry could manage to expand to feed that because you see that that graph going up over there that's all on the on account of textile we have another question from here yeah, thank you for the detailed uh, presentation uh, going back to the title question uh, could you please qualify for us what do you mean by pre modern yes. as well as cosmopolitan? Because I was also listening yeah, I, to your. I deliberately stayed away from. Could I complete term, my questions, modern? please? Sorry? Could I complete my questions, okay. please? Because I have a couple of them. Okay. Uh, and as I read uh, the abstract, uh, I can see the word neutral here. Hmm. Uh, so you have written something like. Um, hmm. 
the Qutub Shahis of Golconda Gol Gol was neutral in its trade. So does neutrality qualify for cosmopolitanism or pre-modern? So I was a little confused about that. No. So what was that? And um, then the third question is about, so if this was the, so if there is populous and popular uh, Masulipatnam in 17th, 17th century and especially before the arrival of British, right. what happens with the modernity? So I understand that you are focusing only on 17th century and yes. medieval period per se, but what happened with the modernity? Did it prosper? Did Masulipatnam prosper with modernity? Did it decline? And then do we recontextualize our understandings of modernity and pre-modern in this particular context? So that's my so, intervention. Uh, Thank you. It's a little premature for me to get to the modernity part, but I will touch upon that at a later time. When, when I, I deliberately use the term pre-modern, uh, though I could also use the term early modern coined by Sanjay Subramanian for this time period, you know, 15th to 18th century period. Um, the pre-modern specifically because uh, I, in a premature manner, am questioning the kind of uh, stereotypes or assumptions that we have towards what we consider uh, prior to modernity coming in with the European colonization. Okay, and in terms of the cosmopolitanism that you're talking about, what we are referring to here as cosmopolitanism is the multi multi um, national, multicultural, uh, multi ethnic, multi linguistic presence in these hubs of uh, you know exchange and trade and intense interaction taking place which is in fact very intimately connected to the neutrality, the deliberate state policy to keep it neutral, to allow people from all religions and faiths and regions and nations to trade there. Because for in, the, in this pre-modern ethos, um, where you, you, know, uh, you have different kinds of political boundaries and uh, transitions would probably involve you know, rules changing. But for the traders, they need to have a certain amount of stability to ensure that they can have smooth transactions and transitions, right? Just a quick follow-up, if I can. Uh, um, so, do we then mean that this was a laissez-faire state in the of a kind because it talks about non-intervention in the market or something of that sort? Uh, that I would like to, uh, yeah, like to answer that. Yeah. Actually, let me tell you one thing. Throughout the history of India, historians, foreign travelers, visitors have said that India is a free society. It was a free society and Meenakshi ji, uh, of course, is here. She will talk about ancient India. It was a free society in so many ways. And they have said it in praise. We were a free society. Of course, there are certain negative things which also happened to us because we were a free society. But we were free also in the sense that we did not put too many barriers when it came to economic relations with the world. And that is the reason, actually. In fact, my opinion is that more than China, in the history of mankind, it is India which was at the center of what is described as world systems by Wallstein. So that is, I think, very, very important. That kind of probably racist fair will not be the right word. Yeah. But certainly throughout history, travelers and yeah. So, you know, it's not like you won't find that the you know uh, weavers are going to sell their textiles only to uh, indigenous merchants they will look at who's going to give them more profit right and profit uh, was what uh, came behind the collaborations which took place amongst the native authorities and the, the merchant magnates that we talked about and the europeans in fact, actually, uh, this private trade aspect which I've brought in, there are several um, accounts where you can see that in the interior, these uh, Europeans, the English and others have um, have got their own direct contact with uh, weavers and merchants and so on, um, even though the company was trading with uh, in textiles to um, Komiti merchants who were the textile merchants, but they could even directly go into the interior villages and, you know, uh, so you, you will find uh, so that you know, sometimes the Dutch are buying out all the um, textiles because they're giving them more money. So the English are, but they don't have as much fluid, uh, liquid uh, money as the Dutch to invest, and uh, they are trying to, you know, find ways and means of filling their ships. 
because apart from these there are there's a mention of like 20 ships of interlopers they are not of any of the companies they are also buying up textiles you know so uh, we have another question from Madhuri. from your uh, no, your related. question about this uh, sanitized i don't think we can call it sanitized at all there were conflicts which are very visible but there were also collaborations but these conflicts are in no way related to any kind of religious persecution in fact the dislocation which is taking place in the time which has caused masuli patnam to decline uh, is because of uh, not just the Mughal conquest of Golconda, but very, very uh, significantly because of the Maratha inroads, because we were fleeing their uh, villages and going and seeking refuge in Fort St. George, where they were getting protection because they are going to weave cloth, which is, you know, which is their livelihood, and they need uh, protection. And they were getting that in Fort St. George. So while the English trade starts to prosper at this point of time, when Masuli Patnam is declining, in fact, because the Kingdom of Golconda, which had fostered Masuli Patnam deliberately as a state policy, has now declined, the shipping which was centered around there has also moved somewhat to freighting from Fort St. George on the English ships, has also moved upwards to uh, Vishaka Patnam and Bindi Patnam at the, uh, in the 18th century. No, my point was not that you sanitized the religious part, this, that, and the other. Actually, I was referring to the uh, to the nature of the state as well as the uh, incoming powers. Mm -hmm. Now we know that the kind of trade Europeans indulged in mm -hmm. was not normal trade. Indians had one second. Mm -hmm. Let me finish. Hundreds and thousands of years, Indians had been trading and their goods were sought after. Um, even Roman Empire talks about how its coffers are getting emptied because of Indian silks and jewels and steel for swords and all that. And they have nothing to give in return. The trouble with Europe was that it had nothing to give India that Indians really wanted. Other than bullion. Huh? Other than bullion. Gold and silver. Yes, and, and they were not happy with... But they brought it? No, no. Just let me finish. I'm saying they had... It was not trade except if they brought in gold. Okay, that's, that's the bottom line. And you know very well that the British changed this whole game precisely because they didn't want to keep bringing in gold. Okay. Just let me finish. Mercantilist okay. ideas. And, and, and they... And, and the process was, they, they, even in England, they called them robber barons. They didn't call them normal traders. They didn't follow normal trade practices. And that's why when there was a phrase in your presentation, so long as they could execute justice. Are they justice? Justice and to those they employed. Employed. You know what that means. Uh, I'm saying. Uh, let, me, uh, the, let, me just, let me just finish. No, I let me just finish. I do want to answer there that are, part is very significant. So but let me finish. Okay. Uh, there are, I want to also link to what she's saying, mm -hmm. which is, uh, she, uh, I asked you to define cosmopolitanism, and she asked you to define modernism. Because, what is con because modernism is used really as a loaded, value-loaded term. Yeah. What came to be moder modernity in, in, in the Indian context was wrecking of the Indian economy and quality. Nothing very... Uh, Madhuji... One, one, one last point. Yes, you say. And he raised a very important point about the language sources. Because, for example, if you have to do French history, you, you just won't get admission anywhere in France to do French history without knowing French. If you want to do German history or Chinese, you would need to know the language. Here we are studying Indian history, what happened in south of India, using primarily English language sources or translated. Because there is a paucity of material. No, no, but Tamil, I'm saying, kahin bhi aap or research karne jayenge, wo kahenge language aati hai ki nahi so aati? So there's a diary of Ananda Raga Pillai. He was the Dubash or translator for the French. But his records are there for the 18th century, not for the 17th. And there he does start to differentiate between the uh, the, the Valandes or the you know Dutch and the Angre, Anglais and, and so on so, so forth. Before largest, that, the, the one, one is, just let me just finish this, is that there is a, 
a very sort of non specific uh, um, understanding of europe in the 17th century throughout the even though the portuguese have already been there hmm? uh, but so far as the indigenous sources are concerned yes that is a glaring uh, you know gap in terms of this work that i still have to use that but i'm not going to get this kind of information there but still i want to see what kind of information in fact that is going to be hopefully done at some point of time but so far as what you're saying about the wrecking of the indian economy that is not taking place in the 17th century and i think we went through that entire thing of how the english east india trade was really very very uh, uh, you know uh, it was quite pathetic up until they managed to found uh, fort st george it is only one example that i put over there but this is a constant lamentation to the board of directors send us more money send us send us a way to so improve now, our situation running completely situation. out of time just a couple of clarifications just that to just to make this point no, that no, it was understand. not it was in fact there were uh, merchants that could buy the english east india company several times over at this point of time <laughs> that we talking about yeah i think a couple of uh, you know uh, observations and uh, some uh, questions from my side uh, maybe we have just 5 minutes and no one more point even at the time that the english fortunes have gone up we do not have any hard evidence to show that indigenous shipping had declined because they moved to other ways of doing it in fact there are a few stray references which point to that is yet to be more conclusively determined because we don't have quantifiable figures for the volume of shopping for the indigenous so nali uh, uh one thing i believe that there is some of course uh, how should i put it uh, it's a kind of you know uh, very very uh, diverse interpretation of some of the words that of course are used here uh to the students of medieval history they may sound self evident you know but the point that is being made here is no that you should clarify what you mean by them yeah. when we have uh, you know uh, an audience which also includes historians who don't and others who don't specialize in medieval india you see this pre modern term of course uh, in history you see there are basically two terms pre modern early modern so the europeans use the word early modern for this period 16th and 17th century but in india generally we used the medieval but of late we have changed from medieval to we have started calling it either pre modern or early modern that transition has taken place so i believe uh, let me just so early modern yeah. assumes a sort of you know movement towards modernity yes yes and so, I think I it also is uh, there is only that one way I, to get to modernity that so there's just a one image of why, modernity that is why that is why i think you know that is the that is the that is the thing you know uh, uh, which is important anyway now you see uh, two uh, questions which uh, are of the macro level which i wanted to ask uh, you have done a case study on the subject and very detailed and uh, i'm happy about that but the question that arises is you talk about the fact that masuli patnam rose in prominence in the 17th century because of two factors it did not have a good geographical location and ecological uh, problems were there and because of that it was not a good port site and you say then that it is because of two factors that is the support of the qutub shahi kingdom which because of its own reasons it wanted revenue from there and it wanted other things naturally it supported i don't doubt it and the advent of europeans especially the dutch and you are saying that the english were not so powerful in fact english were doing very badly and it's only towards the end of the 17th century and i agree with you there that the english picked up much later than the dutch i quite agree with you there however the larger methodological question that arises from this is what is the relationship complex relationship i will say between the geographical location of the important port cities of coastal india in uh, the last say 2000 years or so at least from the greco roman time and and support given by the state whether it was qutub shahi or any other state vijayanagar kingdom or any other kingdom and the role played by the foreign merchants you see because there is one fallacy in my opinion and i would say that many uh, you know historians of ancient india arya sharma was one of them when he argued about can we also ask a question from pune Uh, just give me a minute yeah. uh 
just give me a minute uh, uh minakshi ji here is here she will say you know she will talk about how this entire thesis of the rise of feudalism assumes that international trade declined because the romans stopped trading you know i think so, we i i think i that that has already been comment, no no that has already been worked on by several scholars yes. who uh, already show that well, that doesn't stand ground so yes. i don't need to venture there because the whole idea of feudalism and decline of trade and so on has already been annulled but so far as your specific questions are concerned as to the factors which read so geographical location is only one aspect it doesn't mean that just because it you know the subcontinent so where is the the monsoonal flow southwest monsoons northeast mo mo monsoons which in the you know um, pre steam engine age it gives that power for sailing but that's why the cycles are seasonally determined but it's not just that it's also to do with the hinterland and its what it produces and in this case the uh, the textile industry is the backbone of the entire indian ocean trading system in fact if you look at the figures it is uh, the maximum uh, profits come out from what in a free industrial setup is this massive textile industry which uh, caters right from europe to japan yes so that is that advantage is what is really giving this uh, the no, sport I, its its strength uh, and merit and from, but also along the coast whichever of these areas get the little support from the state I to develop it but uh, from your response another question then arises and it is this what was so distinctive about masuli patna because whatever words we use pre modern cosmopolitan the, the state yeah, the state infrastructure yeah. which which no, and, and yes also let, the coming let, of let, the european just complete what i what i want to ask is this uh, whether or not we agree with the use of words that's a different matter but i understand the phenomena you are talking about and i see that point uh, what is important uh, for us to know is because you have done a case study on masuli patnam but of course you have done uh, work on uh, trade in uh, uh, in indian history do you think that there is anything really distinctive about uh, the case of masuli patnam the same thing was in my opinion well, it was happening it in, was actually rivaling surat in the in the in the position that it held mm. for the europeans at least and that's where your question comes in because in one of the particular years i have, cannot remember exactly the which year it is but i think it is in the 60s that we talking about out of 15 ships that set out of england seven were for masuli patnam and the bay that as we showed you know the bay factories that they called for this textiles and five were for surat and three were for bantam of which one was to stop by at madras on its way to bantam so more than half the shipping is going to this this region and what is the specific advantage of masuli patnam because it is on the krishna godavari delta which is a rich rice producing region that gives very cheap livelihood to the weavers so you have been saying that masuli patnam is part <laughs> of a larger chain of such cities four cities which had similar approach. and all of these uh, production centers that are shown on the map palakolu viraswaram petapoli and so on so forth they are also textile producing towns and villages all right i think we have run now completely out of money thank you very much uh, Uh, I think now we will uh, call one it last. No, we can't okay, take more I'm questions. Okay, I'm sorry. Now we will carry on this discussion here uh, over here. Yeah. Uh, can we? Uh, I'm sorry, we have run out of time completely. Maybe you can email. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, my bad luck. I could not interact with uh, Dr. Sonali Mishra, but then uh, her presentation was excellent because I belong to Machli Patnam. That's why I was most interested in knowing about this. Very very so interesting. Much. We are so glad to hear that there is somebody from Mozambique. So I, I have to yeah. come there to see all the the Dutch cemeteries and and uh, yes uh, yes. I'm we have French beta. <laughs> we have regions which are uh, you know named after Dutch and the French. Yes. Uh, uh, and some of the British uh, places uh, are also named uh, after the you know these European travelers and other things. But of course, I just wanted to know. Whether you had bandar laddu, because we also call it as bandar. I don't yeah. know if Sonali must be knowing. Word for port. Machli Patnam is fondly called as bandar. Bandar. It was simply called bandar. Local bandar connection. Bandar Mubarak, you know, the celebrated port, and uh, Masuli Patnam, uh, Machli Patnam is is either as fish town or from the Masula boat. I think we have run completely yeah. out right. of time. Right. Thank right. you very much for being right. there. Thank you. Now we will continue it over tea. Please. <laughs> All right